Accordingly, I wrote the same thoughts in a non capsulated way, and resolved to see what air and exercise might do for my meditations, thus proceeded to my favourite walk. I've been wondering both of the time, hopes of meeting you. Will you do me the honour of being this letter? last night laid to my charge. First, that I detached Mr. Bingley from your sister, and the other that I had, in defiance of honour, blasted the prospects of Mr. Wickham. Ah, Miss Bennet, you are well known in Hertfordshire. I had not been long in Hertfordshire. <laughs> Would you think me too forward if I applied to you for a second dance? Before I observed my friend's behaviour and perceived his most surprising partiality. Your sister I also watched. And though her manners were open and engaging, there was no symptom of warm regard or sentiment. She received his attentions, but remained, to my eye, indifferent. My objections to the marriage proceeded also from other causes of repugnance. Your family's want for propriety, portrayed by your mother's manners, your younger sister's forwardness, and even, forgive me, your father's misplaced wit, all confirmed my sense. That I must preserve my friend from a most unhappy connection. In London, I found his sister's uneasiness. I had been greatly excited. And we were alike sensible that no time, time should be lost in detaching him. Bingley has great natural modesty with a stronger dependence on my judgment than on his own. To convince him he had deceived himself was not difficult. On, on this, this subject, subject, I have, I have nothing, nothing more, more to say and, and no apology, apology to offer. With respect to that other, more weighty accusation of having injured Mr. Wickham, that I will attempt to refute. In short, his behavior to me has been scandalous. My father was not only fond of this young man's society, but I hoped the church would be his profession. And intended to provide for him in it. He would situate him at the family parsonage and provide a legacy of one thousand pounds. On my father's death, Mr. Wickham wrote to inform me that I have resolved not to pursue a church living, but to study law, for which the thousand pounds would be insufficient. I hope you shall not think it unreasonable for me to expect more immediate pecuniary advantage. The business was soon settled. He resigned all claim to assistance in the church. And accepted in return three thousand pounds. Three years later, he applied to me again, having found the law an unsuitable study, and being then again resolved to be ordained. This must be false. This cannot be. He assured me his circumstances were Exceedingly bad. Indeed, on both sides, this is merely an assertion. And yet, every line confuses my belief in Mr. Darcy's infamy. You can hardly blame me for refusing his entreaty, and his resentment was so great. You betray your father's honor and your own wishes, sir, that every appearance of acquaintance was dropped. Last summer, he again most painfully obtruded on my notice. My sister Georgiana, for whom Mr. Fitzwilliam and myself were mutual guardians, was taken from school at her wish and established in London. Mr. Wickham, by covenant, recommended himself to her. Ah, Miss Darcy, it is my pleasure to renew your acquaintance. She was then but fifteen and was persuaded to believe herself in love and consented to an elopement. Fortunately, regarding his second father, she confessed her plans to me. You may imagine what I felt and how I acted. I wrote to Mr. Wickham in undisguised heat, and he left London immediately and alone. His chief object had unquestionably been my sister's fortune of thirty thousand pounds, and, in hopes, I believe, of revenging himself on me. In this life, his attentions to Miss Kane seem from a view solely and hatefully mercenary. This, madam the faithful narrative of every event. Should your adherence to me, should make any of my assertions valueless, I direct you to Colonel Fitzwilliam, also guardian of Georgiana, who is well assured of every particular described above. I will, I will only add, add God, God bless you. How humiliating is this discovery, and yet how just a humiliation. Had I been in love, I could not have been more wretchedly blind, and yet vanity, not love, has been my folly. With regard to 
the mention of my family and turned so mortifying. My sense of shame is severe. The defects, I fear, are hopeless of remedy. My mother puts herself forward beyond all expectation, while my father does nothing to control the unrestrained giddiness and self willed carelessness of my younger sisters. Only excepting dear Jane, what could I call them all but ignorant, idle, and vain? How, how humiliating is this? I, who have prided myself on my discernment, how despicably I have acted. Until this moment, I did not know myself.
I must rejoice that he is wise enough to assume even the appearance of what is right, or I must deter him from such foul misconduct as I have suffered by. But I fear I must leave you. Where are on the march? A last word on Mr. Darcy. His manners, being in a state of improvement, may be imputed to his wish of forwarding with his new affability. He met with the daughter of Lady Catherine de Boer. He met long contemplated by both families as they boomed the growth of their estates and a honorable continuance of their lives. But, Miss Venice, I'm not sure we'll meet again. I wish you good fortune in whatever way your inclinations may lie. With the departure of the regiment and many acquaintances came a cloud of gloom over our domestic circle. Lydia has promised to write very often, but her letters are always very short. Why, such and such officers had attended them. Why, she had seen such beautiful ornaments as made her quite wild. And how she had purchased another new gown and another new parcel. And my tour of the lakes with the gardeners now became the object of my happiest thoughts. 